So welcome back again, everyone, to this Civics Project. Uh, today's topic is the U.S. Congress. I'm Beth Rabay, the Director of Repair and the sponsor, which is the sponsor of the Civics Project. Uh, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and uh, say that Repair acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar at the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarahatom, the indigenous peoples in this place. We pay our respects to Hanukvatam, the ancestors, Ahihiram, the elders, and Iohinkem, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Uh, before we jump into today's material uh, focused on the U.S. Congress, I want to uh, jump into... I want to make, uh, sorry, one correction from last week's session on the executive branch. Last week, I referred to the 22nd Amendment being added to the Bill of Rights, and that was uh, an error. I misspoke and should have said that the 22nd Amendment was added to the Constitution, but not the Bill of Rights as the letter, as the latter term only refers to the two, first 10 amendments to the Constitution. So as noted, today's focus is on the Congress, the legislative branch, and those of you who have been logging in before know that my past episodes have been uh, very historical in focus, Uh, but today I'm going to mostly focus on the contemporary context because there's so much going on right now. So I want to just first offer some basic information about the structure of the U.S. Congress for those of you who have a background in law and policy. This should all be very familiar. And once we've done that, we'll move into looking at what's happening in the new session of Congress and the ways in which individuals can get more literate or informed about uh, policy and legislation on the ground. So Congress conducts its work in two-year terms, and those terms run from January 1st of the year after a presidential or midterm election through the end of the following year. So we're currently in the new 117th session of the U.S. Congress, and the 116th session just ended in December. And this session will continue through the end of 2022. There are currently 535 voting members of Congress, 100 in the Senate and 435 in the House of Representatives. And we also have what are called non-voting delegates in the U.S. House of Representatives. Those of you who've been watching the impeachment hearings in the last week may have noted that one of the impeachment managers from the House is um, the... U.S. delegate from the U.S. Virgin Islands. So there are five non-voting delegates. They don't represent U.S. states. They represent the District of Columbia and four colonized U.S. territories, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, the Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa. And in addition, there's a a unique Basically, basically still a delegate because that person has the same powers, but what's called a resident commissioner uh, representing Puerto Rico. And the non-voting delegates can vote in committees and they can introduce legislation, but they don't get a vote on the floor. And that applies to, again, the five non-voting delegates and the resident commissioner from Puerto Rico. I have a very, if you hear her in the background, I have a very energetic cat right now who's asking for attention. Um, So representatives to the House serve two-year terms. And when there's an open seat during a term, there's generally a special election in the congressional district that elected that representative, so the part of the state responsible for electing the representative. The Puerto Rican resident commissioner commissioner is the only representative to the U.S. House who doesn't have two-year terms. The Puerto Rican resident commissioner is, holds a four-year rather than a two-year term. The 435 House seats are roughly proportionate to the population, so that means that the U.S.'s largest state, California, currently holds 53 of the 435 seats. In contrast, the seven smallest states have only one representative. Those are Alaska, both of the Dakotas, Wyoming, Montana, Vermont, and and Delaware. So each of those gets one representative. California gets 53, and then we have a spectrum between two and up in the remaining uh, states. 
Uh, senators, in contrast, have six-year terms, and since there are a hundred of them, one third of the Senate goes up for election every two years. So one year it'll be 34 seats, and the other two years it's 33 seats. When a seat becomes open uh, within a six-year term, because a senator has resigned, passed away, or in rare instances has been expelled or removed. Um, generally, replacements will be appointed by the governor of that state until the next general election. And then the seat is filled by the electorate in that state. If the term was going to be up anyway, they just enact, elect someone for a new six-year term. If the six-year term is still ongoing, they'll elect somebody just to finish it. So some of you recall, may recall from one of our first uh, gatherings that uh, we had a trivia question about Raphael Warnock and asked when he would be up for re-election. And even though he was just elected in Georgia in 2020, he'll be up for re-election again in 2022 because he's actually finishing the term of a senator, a Republican senator who resigned his office uh, with Parkinson's disease. So uh, in that election, Raphael Warnock's opponent, Kelly Leffler, had been appointed by the governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp. She'd never actually been elected. Raphael Warnock won, but he only gets to hold the seat for two years before facing um, a potential challenge at the ballot. Okay, so senators, again, as noted, serve six-year terms, representatives serves two, with the exception of the Puerto Rico resident commissioner who serves four. Representatives are elected within congressional districts which are drawn by the House of, the Rep of Representatives and determined in part by the results of the latest U.S. Census. Some of you may be familiar with histories of political struggle about where the lines of those districts are drawn, who's going to be counted in a given district. Some of you may know the term gerrymandering, which refers to the ma manipulation of districts in order to favor election of one party or another. And we will definitely come back to these concepts in future sense, uh, sessions, both as we discuss the U.S. Uh, census and as we discuss elections in congressional districts. So generally, the pay scale for Congress members is currently set at $174,000 per year, and they have pretty exceptional benefits, including some which they can retain after they leave office. The primary function of Congress is to, vet, to develop and pass legislation uh, or statutes, written law. How it happens, any Congress member can introduce a bill. Uh, no bill, however, can become law without first going through quite a bit of process. So to become law, any given bill will have to find a separate sponsor in both the U.S. House of Representatives and in the U.S. Senate. And um, then once the bill has been sponsored in both chambers or as it's going through it, it can start in one before it shows up in the other, potentially. It has to be referred to a committee, and it does this separately in both the House and the Senate. And in this committee, uh, in that committee, it can go through an amendment process. Uh, there can be hearings about its content. Uh, people can be invited to give special testimony to those committees, and the committees can do their own independent research. And so their task is to review the legislation in depth and ultimately to vote on whether it goes to um, the uh, whole House or Senate and in what condition in order to be voted on. If it gets as far as a vote and not everything that makes it, not everything that's sponsored or in committee does ever make it to the floor of the House or the Senate, then in order to pass, it has to secure a majority of votes at least, in some cases more than a majority is required, uh, in both chambers, and it has to be signed into law by the president. In the rare instances where a bill is vetoed, it will usually die unless uh, the Congress has enough bipartisan support or, or one party has enough support to overrule the, provincial, the presidential veto, which will take a supermajority vote, not just a simple majority. In addition, versions of legislation in the House and Senate can both separately be amended. So the version that's passed in the House and the version that's passed in the Senate may not be the same. And then they have to go through a process called reconciliation uh, to develop uh, one coherent bill before it can actually go to the president for signature. 
So as you can imagine, all of this process means that uh, many bills don't get passed even within a two-year term. And even if there is majority support um, between uh, voting members of both chambers of Congress. So to give you an example of this point, in the 116th session of Congress, which ran from January of 2019 to December of 2020, over 14,000 bills were introduced in the House and Senate, but in the end, only 344 bills survived the entire process and became law. Bills which are not passed in a two-year session are essentially dead, meaning whatever process was going on about them stops, and the only option that the bill sponsors would have would be to reintroduce it all over again and, re- and begin the process again in the next session of Congress. Now, in the first two months of the 117th session thus far, uh, as of yesterday, thus far 2,435 bills have been introduced across both chambers. Now, some of these are the same bill with different sponsors in the House and the Senate, but the majority of these are distinct. So even though it's only been about a month and a half, a little bit less than that, Congress is also very busy uh, and of course, preoccupied at the moment, at least in the Senate, with, uh, with the impeachment hearings. So, uh, and those of you who are joining me in Zoom can follow along directly if you like. Um, one of the things that's, I think, very useful for individuals who are interested in civic account- accountability and civic participation to do is to learn to monitor legislation directly to see what's going on in Congress. So if you'd like to follow along with me on your own device, you can. I am going to be, or I spent some time yesterday on a website just titled congress.gov, congress.gov. And when you visit congress.gov, you're going to see um, a lot of different ways in which you can essentially learn what's going on. You can learn how different represent- who rep- different representatives are and what they're doing, uh, but you can also see what bills are being introduced in the current session and in the in the in past sessions and congress.gov is maintained for several decades past and so there's a fair bit of legislative history there though certainly not through the entirety of the history of the US Congress so we have different options about how we can look at legislation and there's also different kinds of information available through congress.gov one of the first things that I did as I was preparing for this discussion was search some people that I like in the U.S. Congress. So one of the first people I searched was uh, Representative Ayanna Presley. And and again, I searched Ayanna Presley's name, which you can do if you want to. You may need to get into the advanced search function to search by a person's name, by a bill sponsor's name. And I saw that this year in the new session of Congress on February 4th, she introduced what's called a resolution, which is different from a, a, a regular bill. A resolution, as opposed to a regular bill, basically just uh, indicates that the House or the Senate, and, and to become um, to become significant, obviously, it'll need to go through both chambers. But it basically will declare that uh, Congress is saying something. So. And one of the reasons that representatives or senators can do this is just that they want to make a public statement. So Ayanna Presley has introduced a new resolution to the House, and the title of it is Calling on the President of the United States to Take Executive Action to Broadly Cancel Federal Student Loan Debt. Again, that's the full title. And the resolution discusses the disproportionate harmful impact of student loan debt on black and working class and poor communities and a range of communities of color and calls on President Biden to essentially cancel up to $50,000 up to 50, of student loan debt um, per person or per loan holder. Now, keep in mind that whether or not the House ultimately passes this resolution, whether or not the Senate joins it, um, one of the things that we know is that this, because it's a resolution rather than a bill, it won't ultimately change the law. So it won't by itself cancel student loan debt. But it would show, if passed, President Biden's strong congressional support 
for doing so. And again, that's one of the reasons we sometimes see resolutions. I next looked up Representative Alexandra, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I saw that on February 1st, she's introduced a new bill that is intended to repeal a current limitation which keeps the government from constructing new public housing. So her aim is to resume construction of more public housing with this bill. And both of these have just essentially been sent into committee for review and discussion, so it will likely be quite a while before we potentially see either of them come to a vote. I also looked up one more progressive um, uh, congressperson, and that's uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. And I saw that on January 26th of 2021, so last month, he introduced Senate Bill 53. And the aim of the bill is simply to increase the federal minimum wage. And the full text of it has not been published yet, so we're still waiting to see exactly what he's calling for. But I was interested to see how much support the bill has. One of the things that congress.gov will tell us is how many sponsors are already present for a given bill. And uh, many bills, because they've just been introduced, don't have sponsors yet. But Bernie Sanders' federal minimum wage uh, bill already has 37 co-sponsors, and some of those people are folks who are considered heavyweights and or moderates in the Democratic Party, like Chuck Schumer and Dianne Feinstein. So that's exciting for those of us who are minimum wage advocates or living wage advocates, because it indicates that there's at least a, a reasonable chance that Senate Bill 53 may actually get to the floor and pass. So of course, we'll have to see what happens with potential amendments. I also looked up some of the conservative senators who are particularly in the news right now. I wanted to see what Senator Josh Hawley, who's been notorious lately because of his support uh, for the protesters at the Capitol riots, has been doing. And he's only introduced one bill, and it's titled the Duck Boat Safety Act of 2021. And it just seems to be very focused on safety regulations for this particular type of boat. Um, So that's all we've seen from him so far. I also looked up Ted Cruz, and I saw that he's been busy, and he tends to be. Ted Cruz tends to sponsor a lot of legislation. So he has already introduced 12 bills, so I took a more in-depth dive on one of them, uh, which was introduced on January 26th of 2021 and titled Senate Bill 45. And its title is the School Security Enhancement Act. And I also took a a look at the text, uh, which has already been posted, and saw that if if this bill were to pass into law, what it would do is free up funding that schools currently need to use for, you know, for education, direct educational costs to invest more heavily in policing and security in schools. So it would divert funding from the direct provision of education into Uh, paying for more security officers, more police in schools, more metal detectors, and would pay for schools to get bullet-resistant doors and windows. Uh, Let's see, I also looked up Senator Mitch McConnell and saw that he's already introduced nine bills, but uh, they mostly were procedural, so they reflected his role as the Senate Majority Leader until Inauguration Day, and were doing things like establishing meeting times or informing the president that a quorum is present. He did introduce a resolution, uh, and I mentioned the difference earlier between a resolution and a bill, in memory of Officer David Sicknick, who was killed uh, during the Capitol riots. Congress.gov also allows us to search by issue, and I decided to search a couple of terms. The first was immigration, and I know from prior review that Immigration tends to, to be an area where we see a lot of traffic. There are uh, quite regularly a lot of new bills uh, coming into Congress at any given session and at any given time. So, so far we have 28 introduced and we can expect that over this year we'll see anywhere between 1 and 200. That's common. Of the 28 new bills that have been introduced on immigration, 22 are Republican-sponsored, 6 are Democrat. 
So I did a little bit of review to just get a sense of what's coming up. And for some of these bills, the full text has not yet been published. So we can only figure out what we can from the title or summary if it's available. So some of the Republican bills that have been introduced on immigration so far include uh, House House of Representatives Bill H.R. 865, introduced by Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama, and his aim is to repeal the diversity lottery program, so to um, uh, further restrict immigration that's intended to increase the uh, ethnic, racial, and national diversity of the U.S. population. Ken Calvert from the state of California has sponsored H.R. 453 in the House. And if it were passed, this would have some pretty big implications. It would deny federal funding to any state or entity that, according to the terms of Representative Calvert's bill, is not cooperating fully with federal immigration enforcement. So, for instance, um, in the worst case scenarios that I could imagine, if this bill were in fact passed, and depending on how it was interpreted and depending on whether it was um, upheld in the courts if challenged. Um, You could see, for instance, federal funding to schools being denied to states that are establishing sanctuary cities for um, for immigrants. So again, very very right-wing policy on immigration. Uh, Representative Jeff Duncan from South Carolina would like to crack down on people overstaying their visas and has introduced uh, H.R. 90 to that end. Representative Andy Biggs in Arizona has introduced the Voter Integrity Protection Act, which if passed via H.R. 37 would deport any immigrant who is not a citizen and tries to vote and would classify such an attempt to vote as an aggravated felony. So keep in mind that uh, there simply is not any documented pattern of people who are, are not citizens Um, attempting to vote in any significant numbers. Uh, But since the allegation that uh, non-citizens are voting has been basically a longtime racial trope in conservative discourse, um, you can still see bills like this get introduced basically just to try to make a point. Representative Brian Babin of Texas has introduced the Birthright Citizenship Act of 2021, which if passed, via H.R. 140 would would withhold citizenship to anyone born in the United States whose parents are not citizens, lawful permanent residents, or serving in the U.S. Armed Forces, so any of those three categories. So basically, even if you're born in the United States, if this bill um, were signed into law and if it were upheld in the courts, which I think it would not be, but with our current federal courts, you never know. Um, then this would pretty radically change the rules affecting U.S. citizenship. It would mean that being born in the United States would not be sufficient to grant you citizenship. Similarly, Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee has introduced the Ban Birth Tourism Act, which essentially indicates no citizenship for children born to parents who came to the United States with the aim of giving a child U.S. citizenship. And I'm not sure how she would propose to identify that, Uh, but she's introduced Senate Bill 17 to this effect. There are also just a few Democrat bills, as noted, there are six. I'll take note of three of them as examples. Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota would like to provide immigration status for more battered women and their children through Senate Bill 260. Gerald Connolly of Virginia would like to increase admission of refugees via H.R. 97. I'm taking particular note of this bill because he's already secured 56 co-sponsors and bills are substantially more likely to actually get to a vote and potentially pass when they have heavy co-sponsorship from the party that has the majority. And since Connolly is a Democrat and the Democrats control at the moment both the House and the Senate, we might actually see this legislation go through at some point. Uh, Representative Adriano Espiat of New York is also introducing House Bill 531, H.R. 531, which would require ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and Customs and Border Control staff to wear body cameras. 
I also looked up abortion, um, and I won't go into a lot of depth about these, but we'll take note of a few. Um, Now, this may not surprise anyone, but there are 40 bills introduced so far on abortion, and 39 are by Republicans. There's one by Democrat, Representative Julie Brownlee of California. She's introduced H.R. 335, which would provide more reproductive education to veterans. All of the other 39 bills introduced by Republicans are attempting to restrict or reduce access to abortion in some way. Um, And I'll take note of one in particular, uh, H.R. 619, introduced by Ann Wagner of Missouri, proposes to amend Title 18 of the U.S. Code in order to prohibit a healthcare practitioner from failing to exercise the proper degree of care in the case of a child who survives an abortion or attempted abortion. So it would basically try to um, impose a medical duty on um, physicians to not terminate um, pregnancies and instead try to deliver premature uh, fetuses or babies, uh, depending on your parlance. And I'm taking particular note of this bill. It's not necessarily any more notable in terms of its content than a number of the others, but it it has acquired 193 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives more than any other bill on this issue and possibly more than any other bill that I think I've seen um, introduced in the new session. I haven't looked at all of them, of course, since there are over 2,000. Um, But that basically indicates she's got support from just about her entire party. Now, it doesn't mean that this bill will pass because, again, the Republicans don't have a majority, but it's certainly one that might make it to a vote just because it's got that much support. So why does this matter? Why is it important to monitor legislation? One of the things we know is that many Congress people, and we actually have social scientific data that tells us this, many Congress people believe, and not inaccurately, that their constituents mostly will not pay attention to and therefore will not be influenced in terms of their voting behaviors by how they vote and by what they sponsor. So in other words, members of Congress tend to assume that constituents are going to remain primarily unaware of their sponsorship and voting record, and as a result, when Congress people are acting against their campaign flap platform, they tend to get away with it. So um, a few things to know. If you are deciding to learn about legislation and you want to to communicate with a member of Congress, what you can do is click on that congressperson's name to get a look at their website. So you can do that directly through congress.gov. And if you don't already know who your representatives are in the House, you can represent it. You can identify them by going to www.house.gov and then following the prompts to find your representative. So, and just a few tips about how to communicate. Uh, one of the things that you have a number of options of how you can do so. You can call. You can send an email. In rare instances, people still send letters. Certainly an option. Uh, and today, you know, in, in contemporary context, you can also send video, and there are a lot of ways to do that via the web. My general advice to folks who've never done it before in communicating with your elected representatives is to keep it very clear and simple. If you are going on at length or addressing a complicated issue in depth, the chances are that whoever actually reads or views what you've shared won't necessarily take note of all that. So usually what they're trying to do is simply get a quick count of what issue you're calling in about or writing in about and what your stance is on it, what you want. So clear and simple, I try not to address a lot of issues at once. So at most, I might talk about one or two or three. A lot of times if I'm reaching out, I'll do it just once and send a separate note if I want to address a different issue or make a separate call. And I, uh, in such communication, also aim to be like very polite and specific about what I want. And one other thing I'll share is that when a representative or senator or any other elected representative is doing something you like, it's good to communicate about that. So it's not just to call and say, don't, or I want you to support this. It's also useful to call and say thank you, because it 
signals to an elected representative that constituents are paying attention and want them to continue as they are in a particular issue. And that matters too. Now, as folks may recall, uh, I share a book recommendation each week, and my recommendation for the week is titled A Heart in Politics, colon, Jeanette Rankin and Patsy T. Mink. Jeanette Rankin and Patsy T. Mink, and the author of the book is Sue Davidson. Jeanette Rankin was the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress in 1917. So in the prior century, uh, it started to see, uh, particularly post-Civil War, a very few men of color be admitted to the U.S. Congress. Before then, it had been entirely white and male, as folks know, but we didn't start to see uh, women get elected to office until 1917, slightly before the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which gave women the vote nationwide in 1919. So Jeanette Rankin was that first female congressperson. And we had to wait another 48 years for a woman of color to be elected to Congress, and that was Patsy Mink. And she was followed three years later. So Patsy Mink was elected in 1965. Three years later, we saw the first African-American congresswoman, and that was Shirley Chisholm, who some of you may have known about. She was also the first woman of color to run in, in a primary uh, for the presidential uh, seat in a major uh, party ticket, the Democratic Party. Uh, both Jeanette Rankin and Patsy Mink have pretty incredible histories. Patsy Mink is often referred to as the mother of Title IX. She really uh, was quite a powerful advocate against gender discrimination. And there's, there's absolutely more to know about her career, but that's, that's one thing she's known for. And Jeanette Rankin, I thought, was also pretty an extraordinary, I think is also a pretty extraordinary figure and is probably best known for the fact that she refused in any instance where it came up uh, during, her, um, during her time of service to vote in favor of going to war. And as it happened, one of the first things to come before um, Congress if, uh, when she was first elected was the decision about whether to enter World War I. And she was, I believe, the only person in Congress to vote no. So she was the only woman and the only person to say no. And she continued to, uh, throughout her career, always vote against going to war. And I can only partially imagine the kind of social and political pressure she had to be experiencing uh, to be the only woman in Congress and to be also going up against everyone in Congress on that issue. So both have really interesting histories. And again, the book title is A Heart in Politics. So last thing before we go to Q&A with our Zoom audience today is to go through our weekly civics trivia. And I'm going to put that up uh, for our Zoom audience on screen share now. And for those who are new to the Civics Project, we do um, we do uh, three questions each week uh, related to that week's subject. So we're going to start uh, with this question, and I'll read it out for our podcast audience. How many U.S. representatives were present for the first meeting of the U.S. Congress? How many were present? Answer choice A is 10, B is 13, C is 30, and D is 59. And for those of you who are in Zoom, feel free to put your answers in the chat if you would like. And the correct answer on this one is 13. 13 U.S. representatives met for the very first meeting of the U.S. Congress. And basically, their first activity was to elect a Speaker of the House. Uh, now, more were actually elected that year. Uh, what we know is that 65 total representatives ultimately were elected in the first session. Uh, but on March 4th of 1789, which was when the House of Representatives first met, there were 13 of them present. Can members of Congress be impeached? This is our second question. The first answer is A, no, never. The second answer, second choice is B, no unless the charge is treason. C, 
yes, under the same terms as any other civil officer. And D, this remains contested. It's an unresolved question. So to the, the answer to this question is A, uh, members of Congress cannot be impeached. And this was something that did come up. There was in the late 18th century, one member of the House of Representatives who actually was impeached and he was expelled from Congress, which is provided for in the Constitution, but not convicted by the Senate as they determined that members of Congress, because they are elected and don't otherwise fit the definitions of impeachment in the U.S. Constitution, could not be uh, impeached. And I'm sorry, Zoom audience, I just showed you the answer key, although we have not gotten to the third question. So I'll run through it in any case. What has been the most expensive U.S. congressional race to date? A, South Carolina in 2020. B, Texas in 2018. C, the Georgia Senate in 2020. And D, the Georgia Senate runoff in 2021. And our Zoom audience already knows that the correct answer choice on this one is the Georgia Senate runoff in 2021, which spent over $260 million. And the combined cost of the two Senate elections in Georgia in November and then again in January uh, was over half a billion dollars, over 500 million. Most expensive in U.S. history. So for our Zoom audience, I'm putting up some extra links for learning. And I want to thank everybody from for listening to this lesson today and, and again for our live audience we'll go into q a in just a moment uh, and uh, zoom audience i will also put these links in the chat for you so i'm going to end our recording now thank you for all of you who tuned in to listen today